CMS Vatavaran. Uh, on behalf of CMS Vatavaran, I welcome you all on in the free uh, in the chapter three of CMS Vatavaran webinar series on environmental filmmaking. And today, uh, with uh, some of the most acclaimed wildlife and environmental filmmakers of India, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, the integrity of production of environmental and wildlife films. But before introducing the panels, kindly let me have the opportunity to uh, tell a little, a little about our organization. Uh, as you may be aware, the CMS Vatavaran is a pioneer. In, so as I was saying that CMS Vatavaran is a pioneer in International Film Festival and Forum on Environment and Wildlife in India. And it, it is using films as a window to deliver into the nature. The festival showcase the best of Indian and international films and documentaries. Uh, the festival presents nature stories from all over the world stories on critical ecological and developmental challenges faced today. Some of the most compelling uh, practices as well as the uh, uh, diversity of our planet through the medium of films. Uh, in these unprecedented time of COVID, uh, uh, we are doing a, a, a number of programs online, including uh, uh, the online film festivals, and online film competitions. We just finished with one minute online uh, film competition. And now we are uh, inviting uh, films for three minute online uh, film competition on biodiversity, where you are, uh, uh, we welcome you all to submit the films on biodiversity. The duration should be three minutes. Apart from that, we are also uh, uh, receiving and requesting films for uh, upcoming CMS Vatavaran International Film Festival 2021. You can uh, go to our website, that is cmsvatavaran.org, and submit your film there. Uh, now, coming back to uh, this online webinar on production on, uh, of environmental and wildlife films, uh, we have uh, three very distinguished guests. Uh, the very uh, the one of the most acclaimed wildlife and environmental filmmakers from India, and uh, let me introduce them one by one. We have Doel Trivedi with us. Doel wears many hats at Riverbank Studios. She is a writer, director, producer, and believes that stories can change perspectives. Doyle studies films in Canada, uh, studied film in Canada and started her career working on Discovery Channel. After which she decided to come back to home to make films that would make a difference. Again and again and you will be able to uh, kindly, uh, kindly uh, mute your audio, please. Over the last 10 years, Doyle has traveled to difficult locations with her team to document wildlife in its na natural habitat and tell us a story of environmental concerns. These have included marshes of Sundarbans. Uh, so Bisachi, the I talk you here. I mean, uh, let's just mute all the mics. Yes. Yeah. Sudas, Sudas kindly mute. Yeah, Sudas kindly mute the mics, please. Uh, I'll, I'll unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> Is it okay now? No, there are people who are talking. So I don't know who, yeah. who is Shash, Shashwan Kumar. I think his audio is... This is the Shashwan Kumar, please stop talking. Yes. <laughs> please. Thank you. Thank you, Shashwan. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So... Okay. Arti, now, now you're, you're also, Arti, you'll have to unmute yourself. Sabisachi, unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I'm, am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I was saying that uh, they also work included uh, uh, from masses of Sundarbans to the high altitude areas of Himalayas, the Western Ghats, and the desert and forest of Rajasthan. Uh, she had also spent two years with her team writing and filming 
in the Great Himalayan National Park to document the rare and elusive Western tragopan, uh, which had never been uh, in, filmed in India before. And I hope during the discourse we will be able to see those clips because, uh, like, uh, the people who had already participated in Deols and Gotham's uh, webinars or in classes, they know like they uh, like how it would be. Now coming back to uh, like Deol has produced and directed several episodes of the TV series Earth Matters, which is India's longest running environmental series on national TV channel Doordarshan. She has recently completed two conservational films on and co-directed and written Gyamu, Queen of the Mountain and Looking for Sultan. The films are currently airing on Animal Planet. Our national award winner of uh, wildlife filmmaker, Gautam Pandey, is one of the India's most accomplished wildlife filmmaker. Gautam studied film in Canada and has won several national and international awards for his films. He also conduct, conducts film workshop and has recently trained the BSF, Border Security Force of India, in regarding the basics of filmmaking and cinematography. You Beyond that, you the outdated introduction point. Yeah, both of those <laughs> are so, I'll cut you. Let's not bore everyone too much. It's basically the same as Doyle, and I, I think for two years I did something more than that, which is also very long ago. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, well taken. And last not the least, the artist Srivastav. She is also a national award-winning Indian documentary filmmaker and Asia Twenty One Asia Society leader, based in Mumbai. Uh, two times winner of CMS Vatavaran Award for the best film, Land of Widows and Foresting Life. And uh, in, uh, in 2013, she directed uh, her third documentary, Foresting Life, which won the National Award for the Best Environmental Film. Uh, the, she has been jury member on various film festivals, including the International Film Festival of India, Cebu International Documentary Film Festival, IDPA Award of Excellence, uh, Jaipur International Film Festivals, name to few. Uh, and apart from documentary filmmaking, she is busy in producing and directing uh, uh, documentaries and, 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 and uh, films for Netflix and uh, uh, Z5. So uh, I welcome all of you and, and I hope that all the participants who are there with us, they will enjoy the session. So now Aarti, the floor is with you. Thank you. Thanks, Sabhisachi, for the introduction. Uh, hi, Gautam. Hi, Doyle. Uh, hi, hi. Hope you're having a great day. Yes, except there's one monkey which is roaming around, which is just... <laughs> Welcome to monsoons in Goa. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay, I mean, today is 20th June and uh, it is uh, actually known for the International Horseshoe Crab Day. Uh, and who better to talk about it than Gautam? I mean, you have made... Uh, exceptionally beautiful film, uh, uh, I mean, called Timeless uh, Travelers, The Horseshoe Crabs. Could you please tell us a little more about the film which won the national award and many awards nationally and internationally? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, Doyle was also actually there, part of that film. That's where I was allowed to sit this close to her and things happened. And uh, that was 18 years ago. And uh, Part of the shoot was actually in Goa. So, so being here kind of brings us uh, full circle to the whole uh, and horseshoe crab day. We were going to try and meet Dr. Anil Chatterjee who, who headed the research for horseshoe crabs. And I think still many people don't know what horseshoe crabs are. So if you guys are missing horseshoe crabs, just Google that alongside. It's an amazing looking creature found in very few places in the world. And India and the eastern coast of India is one of them. And it is endangered. And uh, it was being poached as well because it has great uh, value medicinally and for research because it's immune to every known disease uh, to man. And I'll bet all I know that it's, I'm sure it's immune to COVID also. <laughs> and uh, uh, the film was basically, it was meant to lobby support for the research and to... Uh, get protection for this crab which was not protected by law like all wild to, uh, to the wildlife protection act actually so so like tigers are, everyone knows are well, you know it's the highest level of protection which is a uh, schedule one of protection uh, and then there are the schedule two schedule three so depending on how rare or endangered a species is or how important it is so like flies like this one is not protected at all 
which is fine. <laughs> Tigers, of course, are elephants, are snow leopards, are, and a lot of work uh, that we do is around endangered species, and or lobbying for them. So horseshoe crabs was one case where we lobbied for protection and we helped trigger part of it. Uh, I hope, I think, because protection did come after that, and it, it, it is now as protected as the tiger. Uh, and that's what the film was about. And then, uh, you know, it did the rounds, it went to the conventions and conferences. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, you said it, it was basically a tool that we created and that's what we hope to do always is with our films, as, as helpless as you feel with everything going around in the world. And then you, uh, I guess, find a way to use these films as a tool, tool to, for conservation. So Horseshoe Crab was actually mm, uh, a, an, a story that uh, Mike had started uh, filming as well. And so he, uh, Mike has got him dad and who set up Riverbank Studios. And uh, he had already started looking at uh, how they were being um, fished and then poached and from India. But you know, very few people knew that there was some research going on in India, which was doing it very humanely as well. Uh, unlike now, if you look up, horseshoe crabs have been, uh, I mean, there are different kinds and there are bigger ones found in uh, America that are now being, uh, they've been used for research, but mostly drained out completely of their blood and then let go and many, many don't survive. And actually, there's a lot of, uh, this is very apt that you brought this up, Aarti, because there's so much work going on right now. There, there is some synthetic version of the uh, blood that's come out and uh, scientists are trying to push that globally now to be used in research instead of the real horseshoe crabs, which are going extinct, basically. So we are, we are planning that, like Gautam said, that film is 18 years old and needs major updates <laughs> from SD format, but now Gautam wants to add something. But basically now we are planning uh, a film which will take the story forward from where it was left. Yeah. But to add uh, why care about a crab, that's what the film was sort of yeah. trying to nail on the head. And one of the things, and hopefully it'll inspire you to Google it, is that it's one of the oldest living fossils on the planet. It was there before the dinosaurs. It outlived the dinosaurs and it's still here and pretty much unchanged. And we know that from the fossils. So the way the fossils look from millions of years ago, it looks almost exactly the same, which is amazing for any species to not evolve on our planet, uh, which is changing so, so much and so often. And when it doesn't evolve, and another animal is crocodiles, which haven't evolved too much, it shows that they are already perfect to begin with for whatever function that they uh, need to uh, you know, fill in on this planet. So they're amazing. Yeah. Okay. All right. When you talk about wildlife filmmaking, I mean, everybody thinks that it's a glamorous field to work in and, you know, you will get to travel a lot, you'll get to do so much. Uh, what would you like to So, 
uh, yeah. So that was two years back, two, three years back maybe. And to get back to what you said of how you put something of idea to screen, here we had zero idea. Yeah. Right? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there, there was uh, no idea, there was uh, no, no plan and uh, we were just given a tip and we took a chance and we landed up. So sometimes that is important to do as well and you might find something incredible. And then on the other hand, we had the opportunity and time to prepare for almost uh, a year before, or, I mean, for a long time before we started trying to look uh, for the Western Tragopan, which wasn't filmed ever in the while before. Yeah, that's the bird you see. It's the, it's the state bird of Himachal. Yeah. And uh, it's known as the king of birds. And if you can see a little blue thing over there, it has a wattle. During mating, it opens it up and it just looks... Like, uh, like incredible. It's just like it's crazy. And suddenly, you understand why it's called the king of birds. So that's of course the male. Yeah, but we were super prepared in this and all of that, and and it still it took us two years to get almost nothing. It had never been filmed in the wild. It had never been photographed. And then while we were doing this, uh, Rithiman Mukherjee was a great wildlife photographer, top in the country. He managed to get the first ever photograph of the Western Tragopan in the wild. So we were like, oh my God, so it's happened now. That means we can do the, the, the video part of it and be the first and get you know, the video footage. And then we called it the secret life of the Western Tragopan. You know, <laughs> the working title. We'll get this sequence and that sequence. So major planning and imagining happened. That was the idea. <laughs> so, and, and by the end of it, we had to rename the film. Yeah. Because we, after two years, we didn't have a single shot of the Western Tragopan. <laughs> so we had to rename the film In Search of the Western Tragopan. Because it was all about looking for it. There, there was no shot of the Tragopan. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what's keeping you busy now? I mean, what kind of projects are you working on? What's your next film? The next film is actually the, the, the Northeast series. Okay. And Could yeah, you please and, tell uh, us a little more about it? Deo, Doya? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, almost done. That's in post, post-production post now. Uh, that's a travel series, actually. That uh, So that is the other thing. Okay, so the other thing was that we were commissioned a travel series. And the, cha- the challenge we took upon us with that was how to tell this story differently instead of making it a singular travel story that we've seen before. So this is a 13-part episode for Doot Darshan. Uh, they're launching a new channel called Arun Prabha, focused on the Northeast region of India. And uh, so this is uh, going to be a 13-part environmental travel series. So we thought we'd give it a bit of a twist and bring in, find a way to tell conservation stories even through this opportunity. Mm. And uh, also, when you think of Northeast and uh, I mean, if you just, anyone if any of the participants want to google it and you know even if you, you have some think, visuals of it yeah, yeah. So you this, think this is yeah this was so we, we we have it there it's a few slides ahead i'll just skip ahead and we can come back to it that look that was a familiar face <laughs> yeah so this is from the northeast okay yeah, and basically we wanted to break some stereotypes of the images we think when we think of the Northeast, especially in mainland India. I mean, we think of just uh, tribal faces, you know, and we've been, I think that is also a reality. There are many, it's a rich, rich area with very many, many different tribes. But uh, we wanted to tell stories that, uh, you know, showcase what's happening there now, the dynamic work that's happening there the uh, young people what they're doing and uh, how uh, how close how cl- closely uh, they are connected to us and not not different as we seem to think uh, many times in our metro cities they feel if uh, there is a lot of uh, you know well we won't go into that but basically wanted to break into break up those stereotypes and bring some new fresh stories out there so, uh, I mean, this is uh, in Nagaland uh, on the left. It's incredible work uh, by Seno. She's uh, re- reviving 300-year-old agricultural uh, methods 
uh, in this small village. Beautiful place to visit for anyone, any traveler who wants to learn. So, of course, we showcase the area, but also this work that's happening. On the right is. Uh, on the right. Uh, okay. So, sorry. sorry, got them hmm. just fixing something. <laughs> And generally, I mean, uh, it, there are incredible stories coming up, but uh, there's a man who's rebuilt an entire forest, uh, a two square kilometer area, which was just lantana infested. So, you know, th these are stories. So I think that's the responsibility I feel uh, we as filmmakers have, is tell these stories uh, and tell them really loud. And that's what uh, Gautam and I are trying to do. So it's not always wildlife. It's not always, uh, you know, a, a glamorous tiger, which is very, very important. The ti tigers are very important and their stories must be told as well. But that's where we are with this now. Uh, I know what that is. Someone is annot uh, annotating, toting on the screen. One of the, <laughs> one of the, one of the viewers. Okay. Okay. So what are we, sorry, to, com to complete the answer. So we're working on finalizing that. We are working uh, on a, uh, a very exciting uh, project with Gautam has been trying to do. He's, he's, he's been trying to film brown bears in Ladakh. But uh, like, you, like you said, idea to vision, it's uh, taken us a long time to find, uh, mm. find a story there. But there, there are some films out there on... on on brown bears already. Uh, yeah, there's one that uh, came out on Nat Geo. And I mean, part of the pitching process, you can talk about how you may have an idea, but channels may not always take that idea. Okay. Right? So how do you pitch your ideas to platforms like Animal Planet and, you know, various other platforms? What are they looking for? And who's your audience? Like, if you could tell us, like, what is the pitching session all about? <laughs> That's a long process, but yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. But how do you really break that ice? I mean, I know, I mean, there are a lot of production houses who are making content for Animal Planet, Discovery, Nacho. Uh, so how do you really pitch your project? And what is the prerequisite? Like, what should you uh, keep in mind when you're pitching to international platforms like these? Hmm. I think content is king. Uh, I, I, I am a strong believer in that. Of course, then you need a great team uh, to pull it off uh, and all of that. But uh, how strong a story is can, can never be replaced. Um, there is incredible, uh, incredible, uh, you know, young filmmakers who don't have access to great equipment or, or any of the high tech stuff, but uh, they're telling stories which are very, very strong. But when you're talking about broadcasters in specific, it's, it's really a tough game. But uh, I think getting an idea and writing it down on paper, which many people is, is key. And, uh, uh, you know, because once you write it down, then you... Maybe you made a good point. Okay. So yeah, uh, putting it down. Yeah, Harshit Ji, I have a doubt over there. No, it's not Harshit because his mic is muted. <laughs> and I think having visuals already also really helps uh, anyone you're talking to uh, have an idea of what you are wanting to say. Yeah. Because it's it's now zamana of like what you've got, what what you filmed, what you can see. People work visually, so if you've shot something, put that together. And that should be part of the pitch. So, I mean, it, it, like, like a one pager is always helpful. Yeah, writing it down. Writing it down and it has to fit on one page. It should, uh, it should sort of answer the, all the W questions of what you want to make, why you want to make it, who do you want to make it for, where do you want to make it. And with that one page, then you can just go to almost anyone. And they should, within a few minutes, they, they will know whether it's something they want or don't want. And I think... Internationally, that's the the standard, and even here as well. I mean, when you yeah. when you put in a concept, you put a one page. Even if it's a thick thing like this, there's a one page on the top, on the so, top. so they know exactly what you are proposing at this point. 
So, you know, say for the Northeast, our proposal would have been, uh, we propose a 13 part series, 13, right? 13 part series on the Northeast, 25 minutes each, uh, traveling through, Mike travels through, through, through all the states of the Northeast, looking for stories, uh, meeting people, and showing a side of the Northeast that has not been shown before. We do not, and, and then we could even have like a mission statement or we want to avoid, uh, you know, exoticizing the Northeast, which is, which is a top priority for us. We, we do not want to go to the usual spots and just build on stereotypes of it's only about, uh, you know, music or, uh, you know, food or, you know, fermented soya beans or whatever it might be. And we really wanted to uh, represent the youth, I think, of the, of the Northeast and kind of... Uh, bring that to the forefront. So that first page has to have all of this encapsulated in as few words as possible. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, basically when you go on making like wildlife films, it takes a lot of time. You know, uh, basically you have to follow, you have to wait. There's a lot of waiting. So how much time you have spent on your films, like uh, number of years or number of months, if you could put that in perspective for us, like just to understand how much of time is required to make a full-fledged wildlife film uh, when you are following animals and birds and, you know, something which is not in your control. So how much of a waiting period is uh, there uh, which you cannot really predict? Yeah. You can tell them. Oh, tell yeah. me. <laughs> Those telling me, giving me the answer. You can tell us them. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I think uh, depending again how much resources you have and all of that. So, you know, it's it's ideal if you can, if you're really like for Sultan, the tiger film we did. Uh, I think we spent almost uh, two seasons, so two years, about 100 days uh, in the field. Um, same with uh, Snow Leopard, maybe more because, I mean, Filming comes after research, so you spend a lot of time just going to these places and figuring out where you should, it's like where you're going to film, where you might place your camera traps. So yeah, I think, but if uh, filming of about 100 days would be good if you really want to get behavior shots and mm. I mean, it's really, uh, it's really depends on the more, t basically the more time you spend out in the field, the better. Yeah. Uh, so, so actually, let's take everyone through through that uh, of Sultan and Gyamo, how we sort of from ideation, because we weren't really, we, we were filming it, we had a basic idea of the story of a tiger and uh, who is Sultan, that who we were following. And actually, we were following another tiger and this story sort of came in because he was a single cup that was born with this tigress, T-19. And so we shifted gears and said, okay, this is turning into more of a story. Our original idea is now out of the window. So I'll just share the screen real quick. Here we are. So how do you turn an idea into a film? And what you see are the post-its, which were all the different ideas that we had after spending two years in the field looking at the different aspects of the story around Sultan the Tiger. Uh, so we, I mean, there are different ways of doing it and we just chose to do this because uh, we learned it from a friend in film school. So we, we just take post-its and you put all the different ideas and elements of the story that you have and we just put them physically in front of us like that. So you can see over here, there should be a, yeah. So, you know, we knew we wanted to talk about news clips, uh, about you know tigers missing. We knew that we wanted to talk about uh, some poaching incidents that had happened, and some friends of ours were there who who had actually taken photographs of the, the tigers that had died. Uh, there were certain questions that we had ourselves, and we wanted to inject that into the story. So we wrote all those out, and we started uh, arranging it in the format of a film. So the different acts of a film. Act one, act two, act three. So this is actually the arranged version of it, where we thought we will uh, begin with a poaching bust, a news clip, uh, and then we'll transition to an anchor of uh, Mike talking about his history with tigers and how uh, his link with Ranthambore 
Uh, so we, you know, we wanted it to uh, feel a bit cinematic, uh, feel a bit like a storytelling instead of just like uh, you know outpouring of information. Of this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, right? So this is how risky is it to uh, do stories around poaching and you know following up on issues like these? How risky is it? Have you risked? I mean, I, I mean, have you faced something like this in the past? Yeah, we have actually in Goa a few years back. We were filming uh, illegal mining, and then it turned into a very ugly situation where it was. Uh, going to be a punch out and uh, I would have won that for sure. There were only like 10 guys I was, you know, with one other guy, but we, we would have won. <laughs> no, we would have been pummeled to the ground and you have to really keep your cool and, uh, you know, uh, l really know how to play your cards. We, we managed to get out. They deleted the cards, of course. Uh, I managed to recover some of the footage, uh, but they did not break the camera and we know people who that, that, have, that has happened to when you go into sensitive areas uh, without all the information, you just don't know what's going to happen. So, example, you know, for bears as well, brown bears, you know, they're, they're an amazing species, but their entire area is a, is a human animal conflict zone, human wildlife conflict zone. So, people are not necessarily, uh, you know, great fans of bears yet. There's, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, issues based on space and uh, predation by the bears on the livestock. So it's not like Ranthambor where the locals are benefiting from, uh, you know, tourism. There is no tourism there right now. It's just all out, uh, you know, living with a very large predator. You feel scared uh, and, you know, you face losses on a daily basis. So over there again, when you're filming, people are kind of, you know, cheesed off like, why you're filming this thing which causes us pain and trouble? What kind of story are you, you know, representing out there? Uh, and, you know, it's different for every, every film, every situation. In the Northeast, I'm sure you... you... No, you weren't telling stories like that. But yeah, but I, uh, every situation, you have, I mean, I agree with Gautam. You have to judge every situation very okay. carefully. These are very mm -hmm. sensitive issues, a lot of people involved. So yeah, each story is unique and has to be handled carefully. Like yeah. when Mike was filming for Shores of Silence and the whale shark, oh, yeah. um, I mean, he was even shot at. Yeah, yeah. proper mafia and all that. <laughs> so because uh, no one knew whale sharks, uh, I wasn't, uh, I mean, I didn't know Mike then, but he, I've heard these stories from him of mm -hmm. how he was filming and he was shot at because he wanted to bring the story out. No one knew whale sharks even existed in India then. And so uh, it depends on what story you're telling. We know uh, friends who've made films on rhinos and elephants who have got into trouble, friends who do, uh, uh, who are directly involved in rescuing big animals and do get into trouble. So yeah, uh, it's definitely for filmmakers who are thinking of doing telling stories that are sensitive, you have to understand everything. So, so we try and approach it in as organized a way as we can, because, you know, it would be a real waste of putting yourself out, uh, you know, in a situation and crew as well, people who you are with, uh, and then not come back with a story to tell in spite of your, your best efforts. So we, we feel like we try and follow what you see on your screen as we build a story. We need a theme or a purpose uh, because these films need to be seen by people as well. Um, and, I, and I feel like that's been, and we are equally guilty of making films like that in the past, where it was just uh, pedantic and uh, just too dense for people to, for people who are not interested in the subject to kind of watch and uh, become fans of the documentary format. So a theme, a purpose, characters you root for, a forward moving story, uh, immersion where you feel like you are there, a setup and payoff. And these are the themes we feel that uh, have really worked with audiences. And you know, with each film, we try and experiment a bit uh, in a central unifying concept. People want to feel stuff, evoke a human emotion engage the audience with the subject. 
right? And fiction is always fiction is this they're doing it. I guess now it's harder to do it in a documentary series. Uh, documentary format, which is hopefully, I mean, people are trying to break that now. I mean, you see, March of the Penguins, they did that very successfully many years ago. If you remember, it, it won the Oscars. I think it was the first wildlife film to ever win yeah. an Oscar. So it was uh, a story told through uh, the Penguins' perspective and a voiceover. So it broke all format. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that that is something which is, I mean, uh, good to do is now look at this storytelling format. In documentary, especially in India, uh, you know, we, we have so so much variety of stories and so many things we can talk about mm -hmm. in interesting new ways. Yeah, and some themes which everyone identifies with is you know things like justice, good versus evil, love, death, sacrifice. Someone's having a great time drawing on the, <laughs> the annotation. <laughs> so draw draw hearts instead, or, or draw pug marks. So, now, so when you talk about um, ethics and you know uh, filmmaking, so um, I mean, what do you have to say about this? Like, you know, what kind of ethics are required to basically go out in the field in the forest and do your shoot, uh, you know, successfully? And what kind of uh, you know situations you were faced with, uh, where you had to make those decisions between ethics and filmmaking? So. Uh, could you please share uh, some of your experiences here? Yeah, that's that's really a, a tough one for sure. Once again, I'm going to try and see if I can turn this uh, drawing class off. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to... Uh, uh, please don't do this. This is not good. We all are part participating to learn something. So if the participants who are not interested in learning anything from these two... Uh, great filmmakers, please you can leave, but please don't disturb others who are already participating. So I request all of you to don't do these kind of things. It's really bad. Uh, sorry, Gautam. Also, the drawing is not very good, Sabhisachi. <laughs> yes, and, and it, it's really bad. Like uh, you, how the things you are doing, please don't do this. Harshit Goya, please. Harshit don't. Goya, please don't do it. So I know Harshit, who's doing it. We know where you are. I've just enabled uh, annotate. Yeah, I, I am removing them. Okay. Thanks, Abhi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, you, so there has to be a way to remove. Uh, oh. Yeah, there is a way, and I I removed Harshit. No, to, to remove the drawings. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Wait. I think I found it. No, but I can only clear clear all drawings. Thank there you go. Zoom ne kuch ke banana. Okay. <laughs> so very good. So ethics. Ethics. So we have a plate for that as well. That's a really good question, actually, because everything else is yeah part of the you know storytelling and all. But when it comes to this this kind of storytelling, wildlife and environment, that plays a big role, ethics. Mm. So, this is uh, a section about thin line being, being stupid ethics and getting the shot because everyone is constantly trying to get the shot. So I don't know if you've seen these kind of photographs on the internet, which yeah. just look incredible. This went viral a little while ago. This is just one of the shots. Uh, you know, like uh, frogs, a lot of them were with frogs, a lot of them were with beetles or praying mantis in almost these kung fu like uh, poses uh, with ladybirds. And for a while, you know, like, oh my God, who is this amazing guy? How is he doing all this stuff? So, as amazing as it may look, these are guaranteed, uh, you know, extremely cool and manipulated photos. And by manipulated, I don't mean Photoshop. There is some photoshopping, but that is to remove things like wires and uh, little sticks or pins even sometimes. So here the beetle could possibly be dead or killed. The frog uh, must have uh, been put in like an ice box maybe to chill it down because it's an amphibian. So, you know, once they get cold, they won't move around too much, cold blooded and all that. And uh, then might have even super glued it to the back of the 
the beetle. You can see one of the, the hands is up. They would have tied a string on that and pulled it up over there. The mouth is open. Frogs don't open their mouth like that unless they're going to eat something. So it would have, could have put a pin or a stick in there and then removed it in, uh, in Photoshop. So extremely cruel practices just for, you know, creating something. That's terrible. It's terrible. And this is just, I mean, there's many, many out there. And then, you know, everyone wants to jump on the band, bandwagon of, I want to do that too. And then very soon they figure out how to do it. And, uh, you know, even with uh, a lot of wildlife competitions, uh, they have banned photogra uh, uh, entering photographs of baby birds and of nests. Because there was a time when people had started destroying nests so that other people don't get that shot. Or to get a clear shot of the nest, they would cut branches, take the shot and then walk away. But that nest was built there by the baby, by the mother bird, by the parents, so that it was hidden and concealed. But now here it was completely open. Uh, there was also a time when people were uh, injecting fish with air and throwing them in lakes. And eagles were coming down to, to catch them because they were float. So over here you can see a owl coming in. These are not my photos. This is just taken off the internet. And on the left you can see there's a, a, a mouse. So this is baiting. This is again completely unethical. Uh, you know, in India this is not allowed at all. This is not from India, this shot. But, but things like this have happened here and continue to happen. Okay. And talking about ethics, now, this is not a wildlife shot, but I'm sure many of you have seen this shot. This shot, yes. And uh, this is famous. Uh, it was during a famine and the photographer had a plane to catch, if I'm not wrong about the story. And he took this shot as he was leaving. And this child who was there uh, is, of course, starving. And there's a vulture in the back. And the child was trying to crawl to a, to a relief camp that was there. No one knows where, where uh, you know, his or her parents were or whatever. But this guy took the photograph. And he was there to cover this. So, you know, he did his end of the job and he left and the photograph got published. And there was an article on it of whether he helped this child reach that relief camp. And he hadn't because he had that uh, plane to catch. And he just could not deal with his own morality. And he, the photographer, and he ended up taking his own life. He committed suicide. So, you know, you can think of ethics and morals as you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But sometimes there can be a very, very heavy price to pay for it, you know, especially when there are lives involved. Uh, so it's a, and it's, it's a personal battle. You know, everyone out there has to fight it themselves, I think. Right? I mean, we, we keep this in consideration when we film of not crossing a certain line to just get the shot. Uh, because, you know, you have to sleep with that thought of what you did to get a shot. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you, you face that as well as a filmmaker being out there. Yes, I mean, we, we have our, I mean, you have to decide at that point what is important, your ethics or the shot. And we always go by, you know, ethics. So we will never let that happen. And that's yeah. what we should always teach others to not do it. Yeah. This is another shot which is very famous in the wildlife community. There's the Japanese macaques. They're in this uh, sulfur spring. Okay. And they survive their winter by sitting in, in this warm water. So everyone sees this shot and it looks meditative. It looks amazing. There are many films, wildlife films, open with this shot. I think Our Planet has this. Uh, um, what's the one? Baroque, not Baroque. Baraka. Baraka. And it's, it's incredible because they're so human-like and, you know, they look, it, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to witness these human-like macaques sitting in this warm water as it's snowing. But the reality behind the shot is this. You can barely see the macaques. They're there in the water if you look at the bottom of the photo. And, you know, th this kind of leads you to, people will believe what you show. And very often, you know, we are always framing out things when we shoot. And it's a decision to keep certain things in the frame or not keep them in the frame. 
uh, and that's again where ethics and morality comes in. How much of this picture are you representing or not? So, like in the northeast, for example, you know, does it represent the truth or not? Right? Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I mean, uh, you have you're always busy uh, filming or doing research or pitching. How do you basically, when you have such tight schedules and all, how do you keep your creativity going? Like what, what basically do you do to keep your, you know, just to be more creative and just to be more in, uh, in the place? That's a sore topic. <laughs> Doyle thinks I watch too much Netflix. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we all we all do what we got to do, but uh, that that that's a that's a really tough one. That's uh, a personal journey, I think, for everyone. And uh, to create, I think I feel uh, if I just create something, and it's taken a long time for me to reach this, and it doesn't have to work for everyone. But uh, whether it's even to draw something or uh, just make a, a short video, but it has to be something which I can create fast enough. It can't be something which takes a month to make. Uh, I think that helps me stay in that creative space or learning a new skill. I think that definitely helps me stay creative. Learning something on the guitar or origami or something with my hands. Mm. Okay. And I think for me, it's, uh, it's just showing up every day, do a little bit mm. every day. So I, I think that act of showing up and doing something that breaks uh, barriers sometimes and uh, helps you get to that point of creativity because I, I think you have to, it doesn't just arrive uh, and you always feel you're not creative enough you're not good enough there's a lot more better work out there why do this anyway so I think it's uh, it's good to just shut all that out and just sit at your table and just whatever you have to do, write, take photographs, make music. I think just every day, a little bit, that, that really helps. Okay. Yeah. And when you talk about storytelling, uh, since you make a lot of films, when you talk about storytelling, how is it like, you know, how, uh, how has it evolved for you guys? Like how you started and now how you have evolved your uh, uh, craft? Yeah, because I mean, even when like the total video was playing, Doyle whispered in my ear, I hate this music. So, and I don't know if you feel the same about your films, but you make something and you work hard at it and you kind of like it by the end of it. And then you give it enough time and then you look at it again like, oh my God, all you see are mistakes. I don't have to give it time also. I, I see it done and I start seeing mistakes. I mean, everybody does. I think it's, it's just dissatisfaction as creative people. You don't get over it. Yeah, and... And now, I mean, it's an exciting time because the format has changed so much. Uh, I don't know if you ever started watching Vine videos, which were really short videos. And I mean, it all sort of began from there and that's why TikTok and all this Oh my God, stuff. I knew he would say TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, I mean, that's part of the trend of the storytelling, right? That's the audience that at least I want to reach. I don't know if Doyle wants to reach that. Because I feel that they need that information which I'm trying to get to. Like people who already care about the environment uh, may not necessarily need to hear what, what I'm saying. But it's the people who don't know it already, they are the ones that I'd rather reach out to. You know? So I need to change my storytelling to get their attention so that they find it interesting enough. And you know, looking for Sultan and Yama was kind of like a, a step in that direction. It's not hugely different from any other presenter-led documentary, but I think the way we try to construct it and keep it a bit light as well, uh, where it's watchable, feels a bit adventurous like that, and then kind of inject the conservation message all the way through it. Uh, so that was a bit of an experiment which is successful, I think. And now we've been working on 360 VR films. Uh, yes. And, and that's been that's been a good experiment as well. And I'll uh, I'll show you a trailer that we made of it, if I can find it. Yeah. Here it is. 
So actually, I'll share this part of it. And 360 VR, if, if uh, anyone is not familiar with, is uh, well, Facebook is doing quite a lot of stuff where you can just move your phone around or use your finger. But the way it's really meant to be seen is with a headset and headphones. And when you have it like that, if it's done well, you, you really, really feel like you are at that location. So I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the camera that I used, that we used, and uh, here we go. So, so that's me in the, in the landfill area and the camera is, is a ball, basically. And you can see I'm mounting that on this very accommodating sweet fellow. <laughs> he, uh, this was in Hanley and he, he was going to go behind a flock of sheep. So I wanted it to feel like we are with that flock of sheep. And because it's 360, if we, if we put it up on uh, someone who's, who's uh, you know, average height or, or above average height, then the perspective for the audience would be too high and that would not immerse you in that scene. You'd feel like I'm flying over this flock of sheep. So we found someone who was below average height. So with the camera, the camera became average height and then that felt more immersive. So it's, it's very interesting because it's, it's a new format and you kind of keep uh, experimenting to see what works, what doesn't work. So this, this particular experiment worked. So 360 we've been doing for a few years. The first one was full jugar, so you don't have to invest in everything. On the left, what you see are just GoPros. And I made a, a cube out of wood and drilled a hole and stuck a pipe inside it and just stuck it with rubber bands because I didn't want to glue the GoPros in there uh, because most of them were borrowed from friends. And on the right is the camera we invested in and it took almost three years to get to that point if not longer. And technology evolved from GoPros to this. And this, what you see, the round one is an Insta360. Uh, it shoots in 8K. and But it's 8K all the way around your head like that. So if you use a traditional 4K camera, that's like 4K for this draw frame, what you see on your screen. But this is 8K spread around. So actually it's not higher resolution than what you see. So the quality is still improving for 360, it's still not there. 12K is up next for 360. But what is exciting is you're right there when you wear yeah. it with your headphones. Uh, I mean, the quality doesn't matter. You're suddenly in the middle of uh, a snow clad mountain or standing on a river or. Yeah. Oh, a cute heart. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Um, okay. Gautam, uh, I just want, uh, uh, actually, uh, we had limited time, okay. so uh, uh, so I will request Aarti to now take few questions of our participants because uh, the uh, webinar will end by, by 5.55, so that's why. And okay. one more thing that due to uh, the Zoom and Facebook technical glitch, we are mm -hmm. not able to make it live. But oh, okay. uh, but but within within three to four hours we will put uh, the film on our uh, this recording of the session on our YouTube and our Facebook uh, page. Cool. Uh, so Arti, yeah. okay. let me just play. Let me just play this trailer for the 360, so you can okay. see how, how it feels okay. a bit different. No problem. No problem. The Himalayas, like they've never been seen before. Come experience the habitat, the wildlife, and the lives of the people who live here. In Cinematic 360 VR. Into the Himalayas, coming soon in 360. Wow, that's just wow. So this was uh, 
a UNDP project uh, which we had pitched a few years ago, two years ago, and that's the Snow Leopard shot. Okay, so yeah. we'll move on to questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions and our first question is from Kakoli Day. Uh, she's asking, after making a documentary, how do I reach out to my audience? Well, the world is your platform now. You have to depend on no one. <laughs> and, you know, whatever, there is no right answer. So TikTok, uh, you know, UNDP, speaking of UNDP, UNDP is on TikTok. So it goes to show. Also, uh, I would like to say that I think make a documentary thinking of who you're making it for. So yeah. Don't look for an audience after you've made the documentary. Yeah. So decide who your audience is, whether where are you going to, who's going to send it. That's, where a, are you? that's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> do we do that? Yes, we do. I don't know if we do it all the time, but uh, especially, definitely for the bigger films, I would say. Okay. Yeah. We do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what about film festivals and, you know, traveling film festivals? How, how important are those for filmmakers who are trying to reach out to audience and, you know, make their uh, films uh, seen by a lot of people? Yeah, I think they're very important, film festivals. And that's why, uh, you know, Vatavaran is a great platform as well, specifically for environmental wildlife films. That too, in India, which is like uh, hyper niche, not even ultra niche, it's like hyper niche. Because uh, especially these films, like wildlife and conservation films, they don't, they're not seen and they have no function to perform. There is no point of, uh, you know, making them. Yeah, with the lack of platform for these kind of subjects, I think uh, film festivals become very, very important. They give it a platform that uh, TV or other places don't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Our next question is from Parth Monish Kohli. Uh, she basically wants to know about the kind of gears that you carry, both of you, uh, in the field, the essential ones uh, to do wildlife filmmaking. So what is your compact kit uh, which you can share with uh, our audience for them to understand? My DP? <laughs> no. Yeah, let me, let me share it. So we had actually prepared a whole bunch. So I am happy to share Niche. Hmm. More Niche. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here it is. So for Gyamo, this is all the kit that we took, all these bags you see. And this is this was one of the largest crews that we worked with as well. But normally I would just go with uh, a single camera in FS7, um, some kind of a wide lens, if it's wildlife, uh, I would want, so maybe I'd, I'd take a smaller camera like a DSLR with a wide lens on it and one lens for doing interviews quickly and then I'd have like a really long teddy lens on a, on a second camera uh, and a really stable tripod and maybe one person at the most to help me with it, I would say. But this is a larger shoot. This is the gear that we use mostly uh, on any shoot, and depending on if it's a small budget thing, if it's really quick, then we just start taking off, uh, you know, whatever feels like it's a luxury. So things like, uh, you know, so Insta360 Pro 2 is there. If it's not a 360 shoot, I'm not going to take that, obviously. Uh, drones, I would definitely take on every shoot, I would say. I don't need uh, camera traps on every shoot. Uh, sliders would not take on every shoot. Uh, you know, minimum one tripod. If if there is a budget for excess baggage, things like that, then it'd be two tripods. But if you look on the left, the lenses, that's like the standard kit. FS7, uh, mirrorless camera, and these lenses. And I think, uh, and microphones. I haven't mentioned any sound stuff in this. At least one good microphone, maybe even uh, a road mic like this would be would, would be good enough. Put on to you know just to do a little interview, just clamps onto like your mirrorless camera, and does the job. Better than mic. Yeah, yeah. it's better because you can deal with bad video but can't deal with bad sound. I think. 
and bad music absolutely bad music <laughs> okay and vedika kapoor wants to know which software do you use for editing which is the best that you have been using for a while now i mean it depends on uh, whatever you are most comfortable with i mean really speaking uh, if you if you if you look at any edit that you do it's just cut to cut that there are no fancy effects happening so whatever your machine can handle so this machine that we have at the back over here you know over here this this is a pc and premiere pro works really well with it so we were mac based before so we were using final cut pro for that but then the, uh, that software changed uh with the way the, the way it would function became more for content creators to quickly make stuff uh and it didn't fit into our workflow basically okay. so you have to see so you know if you, if you're working by yourself if you have a mac if you are comfortable with the way it works i mean there's no way to tell what the film was edited on right so short answer we use premiere pro and usually don't have a edit on the window sill yeah. it's to cut the glare from the window <laughs> Yeah, I edit with my back to the <laughs> screen. Premiere Pro is great, but every software has bugs. I like Premiere Pro. Okay, perfect. Gurleen Kaur wants to know something which is related to, uh, you know, getting funds. Now, how do you fundraise? That's even my question. How do you fundraise for films? I mean, could you give us an idea of uh, where all we can go and what all we should do to get fundraise? Yeah, uh, I mean that's. really a tough tough one because we are constantly battling it uh, most of our projects have been self funded to a certain degree and then you try and get a, a bit more funds to finish the project sometimes so are you really making money on that project you're not uh, so we end up doing other kind of projects sometimes even uh, you know corporate stuff or stuff for developmental agencies uh, which helps us tables invest in equipment and then make films we want to make oh, so, so income uh, is not really steady income is not very steady i would say uh funding uh, there are a couple of options out there and this year a lot of them have not been active because of uh, covid uh, there's one called the asia pitch uh which is a, which is an asian pitch and they would give pretty good funding every year so if you just google the asia pitch you will get doc edge doc edge it is a great one it's a platform where you can go and pitch your ideas and it has led to funding for many films yeah. i think many films they they're a great platform look it up all filmmakers there's one called hot docs h o t docs uh which is in canada so i'm not wrong but you have to be very uh, self motivated to raise funds i think and and uh, it's not easy so psbt uh, but uh, basically have your idea down on paper and that sizzle reel and then there there are we can share some ones uh, that you can share with the audience there are a bunch of resources online that there are grants there are development grants that yeah. only pays for you to research and develop an idea and then uh, so you have to be just highly motivated with a good idea and there are enough enough platform stuff but it's there exists but, but you also have to think about uh, you know it's just not your idea i mean it's good to believe in your idea but you have to think about the funder if they've not made a wildlife film then why would they fund you right if it's only human issues kind of documentary then i would pitch a human issues documentary to them so you have to be a bit realistic as you go ahead you know and it's very easy to start feeling i don't get supported uh you know uh no one uh, you know understands the value of my idea it's very easy to go down that rabbit hole but we have to understand what the producers want by the end of it so even though we developed looking for sultan and gamo with with our idea in our head we had to understand because animal planet came on and funded the 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 the, the, the post end, the post end of our uh, film we had to understand from them and find the middle path as to what their audience uh, expects and wants sure okay uh, another question from yuvika gogia uh, she needs to know what inspired you to write the story sultan 
the funding inspired me. <laughs> inspired us. No, the funding definitely inspired part of it. Uh, uh, like I said, it was uh, we were in Ranthambore for almost two years, and we were looking for uh, a tiger-based story, and we were hoping it would be about a tigress and her cubs as she brings them up within this forest. And that tigress with cubs, uh, who was going to have cubs, she disappeared and got poached, in fact. Uh, so we had followed her for quite a few seasons and that reached a dead end. But at the same time, we had been filming another second tigress who happened to have this one single cub. And it was not in the most photogenic part of the forest. Uh, you know, like Ranthambore is all around the lakes and that's what it's about. This was in another part of the forest, which was uh, a bit dense, not too easy to film, not too many, uh, you know, tracks and roads. But then we had this footage of this baby cub growing up. So as the plan changed, as the tracks changed, I think then uh, we started developing this story and thinking about it. And then the cub, which had grown up, uh, we didn't follow him when he was grown up too much. He disappeared. And then this funding money sort of came in and they said that, do you have any tiger-based stories? He said, we have one, but it's incomplete. We don't know where the tiger's gone. And that kind of, the dots joined and said, okay, let it be about trying to find this missing tiger. Oh. And we didn't have an end to the story because we hadn't found the tiger. And so we wrote two ends of the story. One is when you find the tiger, which is what we wanted. And if you don't find the tiger, then how do you end the film? So we still hadn't written it out. The last, we were writing on location. Doyle was there typing every day and say, okay, let's add this angle to it, let's add that angle to it. We have to prepare both endings of the, of the film. It was really fun, but yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, it was stressful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can understand. Yeah. Thank you. But, but yeah, no, that's good. Please, please. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Gautam. Thank you so much, Doyle, for your wonderful time and sharing your experiences with us. Over to you, Sabi. Uh, thank you, Arti. And thank you, Gautam. And thank you, Doyle, for your time. Uh, you. Uh, as we are uh, going to end the session, I just want to uh, uh, inform everyone that uh, based on your interest on uh, Gautam and Doyle's work, what we are planning is to have one day Gautam and Deol special where we will screen again, although we had already screened uh, Sultan and, and Gyamo both in our online film festival, what we will do in the in, in near future that we will uh, uh, screen both the film uh, once after one and then we will have a question session with uh, Gautam and Deol. So we will be uh, after, uh, we will be announcing it soon and I will also request our uh, uh, participants to do not forget to participate in the uh, coming chapter of uh, this uh, webinar series where we will discussing uh, uh, about scripting and how to write a script and uh, uh, how the documentary scripts are different from the film script and, and all and everything about the script and we will be joining with uh, of course, Aarti will be there for moderating the session and we will have uh, two uh, very well acclaimed uh, uh, Best Award winning uh, script writer and film critic with us. Uh, so that will be coming next uh, Saturday uh, and we will be announcing the registration process from uh, Tuesday onwards. Uh, again, thank you very much, Gautam. Thank you, Dolph. Thank you, Aarti, for taking the time. Thanks, Abhi. And thank you. For yeah, thank you. And, 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 and thank you all the participants for your overwhelming participation. Although due to the technical glitch, we were not able to uh, make it live on Facebook. But uh, within uh, within few hours, we will be putting uh, the recording on our YouTube and Facebook channel. So please do not forget to uh, go through it. If you want to uh, go through what Gotham said and the list of the equipments and all these things, you can uh, go and watch it again. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for for having us. It was a great fun, and, and it's, a, it's a, I'm so happy to see that Vatavaran has hit the uh, the whole pandemic situation and gone virtual. And I, I think it's exciting times as well for everyone. Thank, thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.